welcome everybody to the uh, 3.30 p.m. panel if you're on the East Coast. For some of us out in the West, it's 1 p.m. Uh, the art and technology of interviewing, how to woo interview subjects, how to set ground rules, how to secure permissions, which is something I get a lot of emails from people asking me about, um, how to get them to think, to remember afresh, how to record, transcribe, and store your interviews. We could go on for a long time, and we've got three really terrific people to talk to about this. So what I've asked each of them to do is, I'm going to um, ask them, beginning with Claudia first, to talk, introduce themselves, uh, talk a little bit about how interview has, uh, how interviews connect with their work. And after each of them have said a little bit, I will then try to lead them to share with us some of the brilliant and practical things they have learned. So Claudia, how have uh, interviews uh, interact been with your work and the type of work you do, the kind of role? Well, I, I'm mostly known as an interviewer and I'm actually the person who brought the Q&A format to the New York Times in 1992. They hadn't run them before, but uh, Jack Rosenthal, who was the editor of the Sunday Magazine, uh, asked me to come over from Playboy where I had been doing interviews and start an interview feature, something like the Playboy interview in the Sunday Magazine. And then other sections picked it up. But even before Playboy, I was doing interviews because as, um, as a kid, as a wee snootling in the middle of the, another century, I wanted to be a playwright. And journalism, well, interviewing, Q and A's is the closest thing in journalism to writing plays. I mean, you're creating improvisational plays as you dramas, as you do these interviews. So um, I've been doing these kinds of pieces since the 60s. So you develop some skills and some insight over the years. Let me say the topic is the technology of interviewing. Well, the um, because we certainly want to ask you about some of the skills to bring to interviewing. So broader than yeah. that. Well, so like biographers, one of the things I do before I do an interview is I try to find out as much about the person as I can before I go in there. Because you only have a few moments really to establish a rapport with somebody you've never met and somebody who may be over interviewed and who is cursed with uh, fame and uh, the distortions that fame often give. And um, you've got to establish some kind of relationship very, very quickly. So the way I do it mostly is I try to figure out a good lead opening question because as the cliche goes, you only have one chance to make a first impression. So I go in very, very prepared almost like a lawyer knowing the answers to some of the questions I'm gonna ask. And I structure my questions and my line of questioning before I go in. But mostly like a, a biographer, I'm trying to figure out well in advance what makes that person tick, what is um, the driving forces in their life, what is the narrative that I want to try to get out of the person, uh, what insights, and sometimes I'm really wrong in my projection and thoughts about this person, but sometimes I'm really right. And if they feel seen by you, they may overcome all these impediments. I think my role is to get people to tell their stories. And I think that's a lot like the role of biographers. And let me say this about technology. I think interviewing is um, the one aspect of journalism that is very, technology matters the least. What matters is who you are as a person, how you can establish a rapport, what kind of lines of questioning you ask, how intelligent they sound, and um, how you can get that person relaxed enough to tell their stories. And that's not always easy because people are often taught to think in cliches, often thought to think in sound bites. And we live in a world where uh, it's changed a lot interviewing over the years. People I would interview in the 
70s and 80s didn't come with an entourage. Um, very often they do now and they come with people who've trained them not to say anything. They want the publicity, but they don't want to tell you anything that matters. So um, I love what I do. I love learning about people and what makes them tick. I know that sounds like a cliche, but the, that's what I do. And um, I, I, I also love the fact that there's a degree of performance to this. Um, that it's not just silently observing, uh, being sort of that Joan Didion kind of figure that just sits on the sidelines and takes notes and sitting. Says there, I like being active and a part of the story. And um, we can talk more about what it is that I do. I've done two books on interviewing. And there, you have also the guru of interviewing here, John Brady, whose textbooks I use in my classes at Columbia sometimes. When, uh, but uh, people think interviewing is easy. It's very hard. Um, and, uh, but it's both the same and different than what you guys do as biographers. Um, I think the performance element is different. So folks, ask me questions. Um, and speaking of questions, folks, if you have questions for any of these panelists or for all of them, please enter them in the chat room at the bottom and we'll be saving time at the end uh, where I will ask these questions of our panelists. Um, you've given us a lot to start with, Claudia. I've already taken a couple notes that we'll get back to. And we're gonna shift around now to Brian and um, having observed Brian at his work, um, I know what kinds of interviews he does, but I'll let him speak for himself. <laughs> well, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, sort of the nuts and bolts of interviewing, um, primarily through lessons I learned the hard way sometimes on some of these. Um, first thing, and I, I think this gets to Claudia's opening salvo on this, is um, I always go in and try to treat it as a conversation, not an interview. Um, the minute they feel like it's a police procedural, they're gonna shut down. Um, so it, it is a matter of making them feel comfortable and that research when you go, before you go in there is absolutely key. Um, read interviews, if your subject is well known, and I see Danny in here and Danny's got an interview, you know, he gets to interview some of the big hitters as well. People you can find information on, um, you know, get, read, read the interviews they've done, try to find out their own resumes and so on. There's no greater feeling as an interviewer when you start asking questions and your subject goes, wow, you really did your research. Um, I, I love when people say that. So, so I, I think that's one of the ways you start to sort of bring them into your corner as well as when you already have, have indicated them, you have an interest in them, you did your research on them. I think, I think your subjects really warm up and respond to that when you do that. Um, so speaking of shutting up, you don't want your subject to shut up, uh, but please be sure you do. Um, you have to know when to shut up. And even Robert Caro tells stories about writing in his own notes, S, which means shut up, stop talking as your subject is, is speaking. Um, nothing makes me crazier. I get so angry with myself when I go back and I listen to my interviews and discover that I stepped on someone's line um, right as they were getting to it. So the, the, so the hardest part of it, right as it was getting good, I start cutting in or something. The hardest part of interviewing is, is be willing to let there be dead air. Um, you don't have to fill every space. Let them talk. Let them let them stew. Sometimes let them let them creep into that dead space. A lot of times, something will come out. Don't automatically feel the need to jump in there and fill it, uh, which is what I always well, not always anymore. But I was always so afraid if I didn't start talking, they were going to throw me out and say the interview was over. Um, another really they might they they might. Um, another really important thing on this, and, and yeah. again, Claudia talked a little bit about this uh, in prepping is I usually go in with some questions that I actually know the answers to, but I ask them anyway, because part of what you need to do is understand that everyone has an agenda. Um, everyone has a narrative they wanna convey. Everyone has a narrative, maybe everyone has a side, they have someone they're trying to protect. When I was writing the Jim Henson biography, he had a widow and five kids. Every kid had an agenda. One of them was protecting the mother. Another one was you know, more interested in, in advancing the arts. Another one was all about his past. So when you go in, you really have to know what everyone's agenda is. Um, be, be willing to read between the lines on that. Be willing to find out who's on whose side. And a lot of times it's gonna take a lot of interviews to get to that. But I do a, a lot of times go in there with, with questions. You know, it, it's, my, it's my placebo almost, or, or my, you know, it's my way I go in there and find out 
let me ask a question or the answer to and see how they give me the answer. See what their spin is on my answer. Um, be wary of people saying, I just want the truth to be known because it will be a truth, um, but it may not be the truth. Um, so I, again, I was going there with, with a control. Finally, I would say be both rigid and flexible when you go in, have your game plan, have your questions down in advance, uh, know where you wanna go, but don't let that restrict you. As soon as somebody's off to the races, don't try to reel them back in necessarily and get back to your questions as they're laid out. A lot of times the stories go places you're not even expecting. Um, so, so again, be, be rigid in your plan, have an attack plan, but if it goes off the rails, don't panic. Um, a lot of times that's one of the best things that can happen to you. And, and then I guess the last thing I will say, well, I'll get to the tech a little bit. Um, I think we're all gonna have different interpretations of what we think is the best approach on tech. I think, and, and I'm, I use, I'm old school, I use old recorders and I walk in with two, um, so, you know, in case I miss something, I've got it. I think the biggest thing I would say is be sure the tech is not in the way. Um, be sure you're absolutely comfortable with your tech because the worst thing that can happen is break up your interview by saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, I gotta change the tape. We don't have to really change tape anymore, but, or, you know, or, or a phone call comes in on your cell phone while you're recording somebody on your, on your voice memos. So, so I think the main thing is you use whatever tech works for you. I'm always that way with organizing whatever works for you, um, but just be sure you're absolutely comfortable and get it out of the way. You do not want the tech interfering with your conversation. Well, speaking of technology, John <coughs> dropping out. So as soon as he's back, I'll interrupt whoever's talking to jump back to John. I'm listening to Claudia and Brian. Um, I can uh, testify to one of the points to start off with that they made, and then we'll go on to others. In establishing your relationship with your person you're interviewing, doing the research does provide dividends right away. And so what I always try to do is I try to find something interesting in their past that connects me to them. So rather than saying, you know, I see you've, read, you've written 12 books, I might say something like, you know, in the book, second book you wrote, you talked about walking across Grand Central Park. That's always been a favorite of mine. They're flattered by the fact that, uh, that you, you know their work more than just listing. And then there's something to connect on. They might suddenly start talking. And I, when I do an interview, I'm never, unless when I start off life, I was in radio and time was limited. Um, I'm never in a rush. So getting a long conversation going where they might say, well, let's go and brew another cup of coffee before we get started really helps warm up. So I think from the, the two of you, establishing your credibility and all of that is really important. Um, we all step on, on the person we're talking to, maybe not Claudia, who's, who has the most ex experience of, of us, but I, I listen, same thing, I listen to the tapes. The one thing I've noticed is when I've been interviewed is I can tell a lot about the interviewer and it diminishes my willingness to be interviewed is if they have a very set agenda of questions. So you say something like, you know, I gave up beating my wife last week and they asked me next, looking at a piece of paper, what's your favorite way of cooking pumpkin stew? You know, this is not really a, a good interview. It looks like John is coming back to us. So let's see, as soon as he pops up, um, we'll do that. And Brian's point, and I, I, I think I'd like to hear, we'll shift to Claudia, back to Claudia, that I thought it was interesting you talked about trying to establish this as a conversation, not as a police interview. Claudia, your Q and A's, they knew the Q and A's were going to appear, yeah. they, whereas my Q and A's are not going to appear. Only maybe two quotes from that hour-long interview are going to be in the book. How did that change your way of interviewing? How did it? Uh, we, I, I don't quite. What I'm saying is, when somebody was interviewed by you, Claudia, they yeah. knew basically the interview was going to appear at most of it. Well, they want the publicity in general, and I try not to interview people who don't want to be interviewed, who are reluctant. I certainly. Uh, when I was doing these interviews for the New York Times, and now I do them for the New York Review of Books, my feeling is you don't have to be in the New York Times or the New York Review of Books if you don't want to be cooperative, if you don't want to sit down and have an exchange, if you just want the publicity, I don't want to be there. So um, I, I say no to people uh, whose publicists have pitched me. Uh, I read a lot of previous interviews and I'll say to publicists, can you send me some audio interviews? Because you can always tell from radio stuff whether or not these people can talk. We need words, we need storytelling. And if they are gonna talk in sound bites, uh, 
then, or if they're going to just tell us these set little patterns, then I don't want it. I don't want to be there. And I think that makes a big difference. Uh, you know, it's sort of like love. Uh, if you're not desperate, you get lots of it. And um, I'm not desperate. Uh, you want to sit, you want to have an interview in the New York Times appear in the New York Times? Great. Let's talk. But what Brian and probably but you gotta be 50 of us run across is not bad as the other problem, the person who does not want to be interviewed by us. Uh, that's, that's often our dilemma. I mean, there's, I, there's some interviews for the book I finished where I, it took me a year to finally persuade them to sit down and talk to me. Um, and that's, that's a common problem that I think, you know, you've got the New York Times and New York Review of Books as your reward. We're, Brian, for instance, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the interviews you had a hard time getting and how did you get them? What tips would you give others of us? Well, so, so first of all, it, sometimes it's really hard because, for example, when I was writing about George Lucas, he, he's smart enough, uh, I guess I want to say, uh, to make anyone who ever worked for him sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, so, you know, it was really hard to find even somebody who would have been a janitor that had worked for him who could talk on the record. Uh, that said, there were people I knew who knew him professionally who hadn't worked for him but had worked with him, who I actually had pretty good luck getting, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, it's a little, you know, day class A, I guess, but um, I could direct message them on LinkedIn. Uh, I found people that way. Uh, LinkedIn is actually a pretty good resource for finding people that don't always necessarily think they're going to be found. And a lot of times I would send them a note and tell them I was going to, and the response I would get back would just be the phone number. They wouldn't say anything else. They would just send me a phone number and then I could call them and we could have our conversation either on or off the record. So you, you can find stuff, you could find sources in, in surprising places. Um, but you know, people who don't want to talk or can't talk, sometimes th that's like looking through the bars of the cell that you're just never going to get to them. Um, but a lot of times all it takes is one to break it open. Um, you know, if, if, when people find out you've talked with a certain person on the record, um, that can open a whole lot of doors. Um, you know, I talk in, this is one, again, one of the weird things about George Lucas. I talked with George Lucas's college roommate, who was actually the guy who directed the movie Grease. Um, I talked with him for quite a long time and I saw someone ask a question about doing it on Zoom. I did this back on Skype back in the day because I think he was in London at the time. But I talked with him for like two hours. And once I had him, I could at least go to people and say, I already talked with, with his old college roommate and I talked with his first producer. I at least had some stuff in pocket. Um, that makes some of those doors, if not open all the way, they creak open enough that sometimes they'll say, send me five questions and I'll answer them in writing. I'm not going to talk with you. But, but you, can, you can back in to some of these people that are hard to get. Some of them you're never going to get and you just have to you know, be okay with that. But other times, um, if you can get one big one or one that looks close enough to your subject, it actually, it opens a lot of doors for you to move in. Yeah. We're it helps to have a rabbi too. <laughs> uh, I, some, sometimes I... I go and do, I, I get to hard to get to people through uh, people they know. Everybody is like two degrees of separation from mm -hmm. anybody else anyway. And if you drill far enough, you can get somebody to, to reach them um, and then introduce you for them. Um, I, mo I, I think the question is, how do we get hard to get people? Well, you just keep trying and you find different ways. It's a little like being a burglar trying open doors. I'm going to pause the conversation because John is back with us. Back. I have, can you hear me? Before we lose you, we want to get some of your wisdom. But can you, can, am I, is the audio okay? The audio is fine and you okay. look terrific. I'll speak quickly. I have been bouncing here and I have no idea. I have my, uh, my tech assistant, also known as my daughter Tess, in the room. Uh -oh. oh, poor John. Yeah, this is. So this is, if you're interviewing people, this is the tech folks you don't bring with you to interview people. I want to tell you that I was interviewing John Dean for the New York Review a couple of years ago, and my tech just went completely and so I asked him, do you, is there any chance you've recorded this? 
And there I am asking Watergate John Dean if he was surreptitiously reporting. <laughs> and he said, absolutely not. That's immoral. I'd never do that. We have some new friends at play. And I said, but I really wish you had. So then I switched to Verizon. He suggested that I had the wrong carrier. Kitty uh, Kelly tells a great story about almost getting, I can't remember who she was interviewing. Jamie, you might know this, trying to get, she almost had the good she thought on Hoffa. And she always brought a cameraman with her and her cameraman got so excited that the question was gonna get answered. He plopped down on the couch next to the guy and all of a sudden brought him back into the moment <laughs> and ruined Kitty's rhythm. Uh, and he never answered the question. All of a sudden he realized he was about to give up the goods and stopped. So uh, when you talk about entourages, Claudia, sometimes it's your own entourage that can get in your way as well. Ooh, well so you, want, you want to do the interview in, in a room where it's only you and the source. You want to clear the entourage as much as you can, including your own. Great, great questions. And I just want the questioners to know that I will, I'm watching the clock so I can get your questions answered. Uh, some of them are things that we are answering on the way. But I do want to focus a little more on getting that interview that is hard to get and share as a former journalist, one of the things I've done is, you know, you, you interview as many people as you can, which of course builds interest among the one that's not being interviewed. Let's say the five members of a family. Oh, John, you're back. I'm going to speak very quickly. Okay. Give us some words of wisdom. John. Nope. I'm, there you go. I am an a, a old journalist and editor who's become a biographer along the way. And I have found that the best way to uh, arrive at a, a source of subject, it's best if your subject is dead. If your subject is still among the, um, as I say, on the right side of the grass, it can be an elusive search and it might be unsatisfactory or unsuccessful. Um, I did a biography of Lee Atwater. Is the audio coming through? I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, you're coming. I did a biography of Lee Atwater in the, in the late 90s. So I'm now revisiting and, and revising and updating. Very topical, trendly, we, we think. Uh, the Atwater had a, a, a method of dealing with the press, the media. Uh, when someone wanted to do a story about him, he would give them 10 or 12 names and say, before we sit down and have a real conversation, he said, with a Southern draw, he said, talk to these people. They know me. They know me. And then, of course, you, you, the writer would make the rounds and talk to all the people who would report in to Lee. So that by the time the journalist sat down with Lee, there was probably more. Oh, my God. Cliff hung. That was a cliffhanger. Yeah, but you know what he's saying is a good technique for interviewing anyway. Maybe not with Lee Atwater, who's trying to get sort of intel on you and who you might be. But I think doing pre-interviews is a tremendously useful technique. And I often say, if I'm doing a long piece, who are your friends? Who could I talk to? And that really paid off when I once interviewed the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, John Shalish Christbilly. And I... Uh, I asked, um, I, by talking to his friends and his brother, I learned that he had learned English from John Wayne movies. And that kind of gave me a clue to how to structure mm -hmm. the, um, the interview. Whether or not he was, my central theme was kind of asking if he was a man of Europe or of America. And we, we, we connected on that because both experiences really shape him. But it was those pre-interviews that gave me the key. So even when, I would say, when interviewing anyone but Lee Atwater is probably a great technique. Uh, to finish the point about reluctance, and you, you've, done, you've done your thing, one of the lines of journalists, and I used to use it too, that you do, is that your last final appeal to them you, you know, the walls are up and they say they won't be interviewed, you say, but you don't want to miss out on having your point of view represented in this book. I've got your two sisters, I have your three brothers. Um, you know, the, your view will not be in this book. Uh, it's John. John. So John, you're telling us about John the- quick. Get John quick. 
so to so get back, I, I don't mean to intrude, but I have to kind of hit and run here. I have found as a biographer that if the subject is dead, you do a different kind of interview. You are not in, in, interested in news or anything that has, uh, um, I don't know what you would call it. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're chronicling information and insight. Those are the two eyes of interviewing. You are interviewing someone to get information or you want insight to the subject. And in all cases, you want to offset any anxiety that they have. When I uh, start, a, uh, when I'm doing research on a subject, whether it's Lee Atwater, or believe it or not, I'm working on a book about Marilyn Monroe now. Has there been a, been a book about Marilyn? I don't know. This could be, this could be groundbreaking, I realize. <laughs> but in any case, I'm talking with people who, and I'm in archives that have not been seen before. And I'm finding that they have an attitude or an angle or a bit of information or an experience with, with uh, Marilyn or with the, the people who would have you believe Marilyn is this or Marilyn is that. There's so much distortion that you have to work through that I tell them, well, first of all, this is what I'm doing. Secondly, uh, here's what I'm interested in, if you can help me, if you can give me some guidance. I use that word, give me some guidance. I don't need information, I don't need anecdotes, I need guidance. And then I will provide them with uh, uh, the topics that I'm interested in discussing with them. I don't give them questions. I send them a, an outline of topics to discuss. And then I call them or we email, we go back and forth and we agree to an interview. And I tell them, I'm gonna record the interview. I'm gonna make a transcript of it. I'm gonna send you the transcript and we'll go through it for an accuracy check. And this puts all the anxiety aside. And they know that they're gonna be able to speak freely, openly, and that they'll have a kind of a, a review at the finish line for accuracy. Now, when I send the, the transcript to them, by the way, there's an awful lot of clerical work in this and I have to do it myself. I have had transcription services and so forth, but I find that you have to go through it anyway because there's so often one word, one letter uh, can make a, uh, all the difference and you only you can catch it and you catch the tone of their voice. So I send them the, I, this is all done by email, but, but uh, in any case, and then um, we go through it. We make corrections. Most of them are very nominal. I have, I have follow-up questions. If they're concerned about something, if there's anxiety, or they made a mistake, I want, to, I want to correct it on the spot. This is not to get PR type answers. This is to get accurate, informative, um, inform uh, in, get accurate information that uh, becomes a document. And I can use these documents and move them around, take excerpts in different parts of the book that I'm working about. I can also use them to go up against other transcripts from other sources that are completely different from what they, they saw. It's like an accident report. Three or four people see an event. They all make a final court and it's, it's, uh, it's like the Alexandria Quartet or Rashomon or any, any, any examples. So you have to do some refereeing and you know who the good sources, the reliable sources are after a while. A lot of them are not reliable. A lot of them have been telling stories that are a little bit pat and get a little bit more embroidered over the years. Um, so, uh, so this is my, my approach under these circumstances in these times. Um, for the Atwater book, I did over 200 interviews, but I did them only in, in a period immediately after his death while the information was fresh and, and reasonably current. Uh, accurate, who knows? You're dealing with politics and it's like dealing with uh, anybody in entertainment, publicity, promotion, um, bullshit. It's all part of the, the process. Hard to separate uh, fact from fiction. And some of these people believe the fictions that they have been telling. Mm -hmm. So they do it with sincerity. <laughs> That's from, thank God for the word allegedly. I mean, we, <laughs> we have ways of, uh, of um, couching uh, information that is, uh, is, you know, there's no, there's no way to uh, be sure that, that what you have is, is accurate. But the search continues, the search continues. I try to focus on conflict areas, on uh, meaningful events in the person's uh, life. Um, 
I had found that you had to make it clear to the subject that you have done your homework, that you know a lot about the subject before you even begin. Uh, Claudia says the first question, same thing. When I did an, I did a, an interview with um, William Goldman, the, the screenwriter, my first question to him, because he was very elusive, he, he did not want to do the interview. He, he, I found out later he doesn't do book sign. Well, we'll resume our conversation amongst us while John's techie reconnects. Um, John mentioned something interesting about sharing the transcript with the person who's been interviewed. Um, so I'd like to hear from Claudia and Brian your feelings about doing that. Well, it depends. I, my experience certainly with, with Hollywood people or, or, pub, or politicians is that if you sh share that material, they will try to change it almost always. Um, so you don't want to do that. But there are times, for instance, if language isn't very clear, if your, your own tech is and malfunctioning. He, he, he died two years ago. In a oh, boy, Excuse right. me? No, John was... Uh, His video was trying to loop back, but he dropped. So I, at any rate, to finish the point, uh, the question was, do you show your transcript or your manuscript? In general, I would say no, but there are times when you need to for accuracy. Uh, if English isn't their first language and you're talking about words, uh, you might you know, need to do it. I, in general, I try to make my sources feel like the story we're doing together is a collaborative project. I'm not trying to get you, I'm trying to get your story. And, um, and that it's a cooperative venture, but I think giving people manuscripts or transcripts, it's fraught with, with problems. It, it's, I think you have to figure out whether or not the person is going to take back what they say, and most likely they'll try to. I think you can also say to them, which I sometimes do on occasions when I do this, is I will let you see this material, but you have to promise me you're not going to change anything except to correct it when it's wrong. And then I have to bargain with them when they try. Brian, what's... I'm um, picking up on your point of sharing the transcript of the uh, interview. Ryan, what's been your experience? So I only, I've only done it on one book uh, because then after that, I sort of took the, you know, the, the, the Carl point of view, which was nonsense. <clears throat> you know, don't, don't let them see it. Uh, and so I, I didn't do it. At the, after that, I, I stopped sharing interviews. Uh, but I actually didn't have any problems with it. The one I, when I shared the transcript was on the Jim Henson book. Um, I'm... <laughs> I'm hoping it was because once I got done with the interview, people felt good enough about me. They didn't think that I had some sort of weird, you know, I was gonna write some sort of takedown. Um, that when I sent them the transcripts to review, most of the people, what it is, they went in and they would say, I got this person's name wrong. It was actually this person. Like they were correcting it for fact more, you know, they were doing that kind of correction more than like crossing out long passages saying, please don't quote this. I didn't have anybody do that. Um, and then I had one person who went through and knocked out every time they would say, you know, they would scratch those out. But I didn't actually have any problems with that, but I only did that one time. Like I said, after that, I, I borrowed that page out of Carl's book and I, I just like, they, they knew they were on the record when I spoke with them and I'm gonna go with it. I make a distinction between public and private citizens in the sense that when I interviewed Robert Redford for this book, I wasn't gonna send him a transcript. Right. He was enough to know if he says something stupid, that's his problem. But when I've talked a person who's never been in the media into being interviewed, I tell them part of the arrangement is you'll see what you said. Uh, you won't see what I'm saying about you. You won't see it as it's in the book. You'll have a chance to, to see it because they, they've never experienced being in the media. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Public versus private. That, that's, a, that's a great differentiator. John, when you send these transcripts to people, uh, is this when you deal with permissions? And how do you deal with permissions? The interviews. Oh, yeah, John, did, were you oh, able to hear the question? Well, when you, first, you have to separate that manuscript from a transcript. A transcript to me is like a deposition. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah. it's strictly that person's take on the, on the topic. I share it. This is a collaborative. We're, we're going to get things right. This is what you have to say. And then I use it wherever I want in the manuscript. Nobody sees that except the editor. Um, and... But 
that's the point where you the, get permission. What do you do about getting permissions for your interviews? Um, you don't I, need permissions for a journalistic interview unless, um, if they've said they are agreeing to this interview and they know what right. it's for, uh, that's permission. That's the first thing. See, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm recording this. It, it's 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 a. Yeah. It's understood. I, I, I don't think that that is a, uh, an issue unless you get into the area of copyright or something that has uh, conflicting um, considerations, legal, legal ownership elsewhere, that sort of thing. But I, I, I don't see that's a, a meaningful issue. And it's becoming one because when I was a reporter, I never needed permission because it was implicit. But from Hachette to Harper's to university presses, I find editors increasingly asking for releases for the interviews that we've done. So oh, okay. I developed one that I send to other people that they sign so that you know, it says, I'm gonna be quoting you in a book. Well, I did that for um, the craft of the screenwriter. They all had to sign, sign off on, on permission. And I, th I think that the, the PR department increasingly leans in on on all of these these uh, journalistic efforts, so we have that, and that's always growing. Uh, the PR people, first word in press is PR, as they say, um, and they have to yeah. justify their fat salaries. I taught at uh, at uh, the Scripps School of Journalism for a number of years. I was a visiting professional, and uh, I had a lot of I was, you know, teaching reporting classes, and I had a lot of. Uh, sort of large classes, 25, 30 students. And I would ask, I'd say, how many uh, in, in this class are majoring in public relations? And answer came there, none. You know, once I think we can, we can stipulate that public relations people are very often the bane of the universe, um, and and and, um, and and go on from there. I mean, they they don't help the process, even when you mean well. Uh, there are some people who are helpful. I want to talk about uh, one time that I do show my sources the material, and that is when I'm interviewing PhD Nobel. Uh, I'm Nobel uh, laureate physicists, and I really don't understand some of the science that they're talking about. In that case, I think it's a good idea to show them what's there to make sure that I don't mischaracterize um, what they have to say. So the bottom line is uh, you have to think of each, each case point by point on that. Um, and some, in some situations, it's appropriate and others not. We have been uh, swamped with really good questions. So with your permission, I'm going to ask you to answer these questions, but keep your answers brief so that we can get through them. To those who have asked questions, if we do not get your question, uh, there are a few that I can answer separately. So if you would, um, if we get to the end of this and you haven't asked it, please email me. There's some very specific questions that I've seen about permissions. I'd be glad to answer them. I know Brian would too because I work with him and we share permission forms that we use and things like that. So quickly, um, how do you feel about Zoom interviews versus in person? Is there a big difference? And, uh, and what might that difference be? I see Claudia is nodding, so go to it. Yeah. Well, in my classes, uh, I often, my students always say, can we do a telephone? We have an assignment where they do a QA, and a and then when they don't do it well, they have to do the same person over as a profile. Um, and uh, people think interviews are really easy and they, they're going to assess them and then they do them and it's really hard. But the long f point of the, the, the story is that... Um, they, they want to do them by phone. My st students in general and students now, the idea of anything in person is so foreign to how they've been taught and how they work. And we have to kind of force them back to getting original material and talking to people. And I always say, you can't do it by phone. You can't do it by internet. And then the crisis happened and everybody was sent off into our own caves and told to survive. Well, I have found that Zoom is not bad for an interview and in some cases better. 
for instance, you, you can get to almost anyone you want by Zoom. It's much harder in person. It m involves much more commitment. And uh, you can get to some people you just wouldn't get elsewhere. And you can also, there's a kind of intimacy to Zoom that is frankly there. If you, it's like learning how to be on TV. You have to learn it a little bit, but it does work. Telephone interviews are the pits and um, my st students want to do internet interviews. And I'll, I'll say absolutely not because uh, you, why don't you just let the source write the piece? You, why bother to interview them if you're just going to send them templated questions? And I know there are magazines that do it, uh, but I don't think it's a good idea. Ryan, what are you, your views? We've got many more questions after. Zoom versus in person, you find a big difference? Or the differences? Did you ask me, Jamie? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm asking um, you. To so so I, I think all I would add is um, I, you know, I think we all prefer doing in person. The great thing nowadays with the tech is it used to be you had to do them over the phone. Uh, now I have the choice of doing it over the phone and over Zoom. And if I have a choice, I will do it over Zoom since it's the next best thing to doing it in person. So, John, we're answering questions now from the audience. Um, yeah. And the question you might want to pick up on, because you probably have a lot of expertise on this, is somebody would like to know how the panelists feel about editing quotes. They've always been extremely careful about the quality of their words, except for us, right. things like that. Um, the experience this person had is when they, the editor said, well, let's edit the quote. So this particular buyer who's asking about how do you feel about being but their, your fidelity to their words and actually editing an interview? Well, um, I think you have to be careful about changing any quotes and do it with the speaker. I'll, let me jump in for real quick until we get John back. I was actually having this, and I think I saw Ray Boomhauer in here. I think we were having a conversation about this on Twitter one day because I'll be generous about, especially when I hear myself talk, I am the king of saying like. I'll say, well, and I was like, and this guy was like, and then he was all, it's, I, have, I tend to clutter my own stuff with garbage so I can be very forgiving in, clar in keeping things clarifying for clarity, editing out sort of the verbal clutter. Now, you do have to remember the context is king in these sorts of things. If someone's trying to this tell you- words, yeah. There can be- Go ahead. No, it's, John's gonna disappear in a second. That's okay. the, If someone's trying to tell you a story about you know, the mayor of the town and it's full of ers and uhs and ums, then yeah, I'm gonna leave all the ers and ums and uhs in there for that story. But sometimes it's just a matter of clarity. Again, I had Lisa Henson is one who said, uh, I was born, you know, I lived in Southern California my entire life. I'm going to be filled with your nose. Can you please strike those? And of course I did because just for clarity. Anyway, now on the other hand, the interesting one is um, I had somebody who swore like a sailor constantly. Um, but that voice was so colorful with the F-bomb in there. We left them all in because that voice just jumps off the page for that. Uh, the question comes, would you, would you, you know, again, this was, I'm writing about Jim Henson and Frank Oz, the F-bomb is the coin of the realm. Do you cut that out because kids might be reading? We didn't, we left it all in and boy, does that voice come off the page. But I'd be interested in hearing how do people feel? Do you bleep it out? Do you put, you know, uh, profanity redacted? I don't know, you know, what do people do with that even in the transcript of the book? Claudia? I use profanity. I, I just did an interview in the New York Review with John Waters. Um, Profanity is delightful. Um, so uh, it depends. Uh, uh, and also your publication may have standards that uh, you have to abide by. Uh, and so, you know, everything, earlier I said that interviewing is an improvisational form. Well, it really is. Everything is case by case. Every situation is different. What about off, going off the record, folks? How have you handled that and what do you think of it? Well, if it's off the record, it's off the record. That's, that's, that's the rule. I don't know, but I mean, for instance, if somebody says to me, what I just said is off the record, it isn't off the record. You have to agree ahead of time. You can't, you know, can't withdraw. Well, so let's talk a little more about how do you handle on the record versus off the record in your interview? Well, I believe that if someone says something's off the record, I, I keep it off the record. Now, it may be very germane to the story, 
And if they keep on putting everything off the record, I'll leave and say, we can't do this. This is, this is, you can't tell me all these things and then not tell me anything that's printable. Um, but uh, let's say theoretically, somebody tells you something in a good interview, but that somewhere in the middle of it, it's off the record. And it really is important and germane. I might try to talk to them and try to convince them to put it on the record. But if they remain off the record, that's it. Let's go to John because we, we lose you. John, how do you handle on and off the record? I, I tried to find off the record or on background, which is a sort of a whitewash uh, phrase uh, up front. I say, if you want to go off the record, I think, let me know in advance. And, uh, and, and I listen completely to everything off the record. That's where the good stuff can be found. Then I'll try to bring it in from another source. Or I'll, I'll call up back later and say, you know, you're telling me this is off the record. There's a, and, and I'll, I'll, it's a little bit of negotiating that has to go on. Uh, it, but it's always good stuff. We, the, the backstage story is, is what uh, can drive a, a story. So I don't discourage it. I don't, I don't dispute it. But I do explain at the beginning. I say, if you want to go off the back, on, on background for anything, just signal me in advance so, I, so it's clear. And then, and the meantime, the tape is is rolling, so it's it's a little it's a little bump in the road, but it's not a big issue. I would never get into a d discussion of uh, off the record with them unless they wanted to. I will say one thing: I was inter I was interviewing William Goldman, the screenwriter, oh, right. earlier, and I didn't know it, but he had a massive feud with his brother James Goldman. They did not speak. He told me, Bill told me, for twenty six years. Well, I didn't know this. I walked into the interview with him and I'm saying, how's it feel to have two, two great writers in the same family or something? He reaches over, he clicks off the tape recorder. He looks me in the eye and he says, if you mention my brother's name one more time, this interview is over. <laughs> and then, then he clicked the, inter the tape recorder back on. We finally got before John. You got it in, Kitty. I know you wanted the end of that one. We had several requests for that story. <laughs> Kitty <laughs> needed the closure, I know. Let me continue with the questions. Um, I'm going to combine two questions that has to do with accuracy. We've heard from several of the people talking about checking up on what, you know, confirming the facts that have been conveyed. Brian, you talked about everybody has a truth. How do you handle that? Um, do you, uh, another person asked, if you find they said something wrong, like, I've interviewed somebody that said they graduated in 79 and I politely said, well, no, you didn't. You graduated in 78. You know, I mean, I didn't put it that way, but the point is, so how do you handle accuracy in an interview? Do you correct it while going on? Do you correct it afterwards? Do you do, what, what do you, what do you do with that? Brian? So, so this, this is, this is a, a funny one. Cause I was just talking about this again the other day. Um, and this is a very minor point, but it does get down because it can be revealing. So one of the things I love to ask people about Jim Henson, I would say, tell me how tall he is. And everyone would say, well, oh God, he had to be 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and somebody would say, I'm 6'2", so he had to be 6'4". He was 6'1". And I had a copy of his passport from 1958 to 1976 where he had self-reported that height. So I had copies of those and I, every, and I would always ask that question so then I could show people, you know, he was 6'1". And everyone would say, that absolutely cannot be true. It cannot be true and I would show them his passport. I tell that because there's, there's the advantage of doing your research in advance. And then when you get a wrong answer, you can actually, because what, you can use that to your advantage because what I thought was fascinating is the whole, there, it's trust but verify in the sense that like, I verified that they were wrong, but I had a trust that there was something else going on there. And what was happening is he seemed, he had, he had a presence. I mean, he was tall and lanky, but he had this presence. He was larger than left and them. They all thought he was so much bigger than he actually was, which I thought was fascinating. So sometimes those mistakes can lead you to something larger about your, literally about your subject. Claudia, how do you handle accuracy? In um, well, I, I, I try to make sure that I'm, I'm accurate in my questions, uh, but sometimes people will correct you and you'll find something very interesting that the correction includes, but there are situations uh, where people are trying to use the interview to slander other people or to settle scores. Uh, and 
you have to be careful about that and make sure that what you're doing isn't being used that way. And sometimes I've had to follow up with more investigation and sometimes I've had to drop using, uh, I remember one very important Playboy interview that I did and the Playboy interviews involve investing a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I went to California to interview a movie star whose name I won't say here. Uh, and he was clearly trying to use this form to get even with another actor and which ended up not running it. I, I ended up saying that I did not feel comfortable with this and I would not feel comfortable if this uh, went on over my name. Um, so it didn't run. And, you know, it cost me a lot. I mean, I got a kill fee for my work, but I didn't get the credit or the time invested. It wasn't, but I certainly didn't want to be party to anything like that. Just to keep us all abreast, it, I have seven minutes to the top of the hour, which is when our session will end, but everybody should know that the session will remain open for all of the participants to talk amongst themselves. Uh, Michael uh, Gately suggested that if you do that, you may want to use um, you know, the raise your hand method to share these, these things you're saying. Um, again, I'm trying to mirror the questions I'm getting. And um, I think we need to have a little more conversation about the notion of permissions because we're getting different uh, comments. Several people have run into the publisher demanding releases from interview subjects. An academic says that since you, a lot of them go through IRBs, they don't. Um, so what I'd like to ask of each of you is in your experience, when you're doing an interview for use in publication at some point, do you use a release with the subject? When do you bring it up? Do you uh, do it afterwards? Do you do it before? For instance, one of the things I do was um, if it's going to be a certain interviews, I sometimes start the tape recorder and I say, I'm Jamie McGrath Morris. I'm sitting down with Ryan J. Jones on May 12th, or whatever today is, 14th, 15th, to do an interview for my forthcoming book on Great Chefs of Corrales. And then we begin. That way I have it also on tape. So anyway, maybe I'm overly cautious, but let's hear from both of you. What do you do about permissions and releases? Well, I mean, I, I only ever use them on one book. Um, like I said, after the, that one, I, I did do it and my publisher didn't even ask for them. Um, now I'm not with an academic press and I know the standards are slightly different, but I, I was not even asked for them. Um, with the Jim Henson biography, I did it more out of a courtesy. And again, partly because I was in that sort of nether world where it was straddling the line between famous and not famous, Jamie, that you talked about a little bit. Um, some of them, you know, were known and not, but I, and so I think there was a comfort level if I would say, and I usually did it at the beginning, um, I would say, you know, and when I'm done, of course, and I will have this transcribed and you'll receive a copy of that um, to, and with an approval sheet. And most of them were like, oh, okay, whatever, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it didn't really ever become an issue. Um, I only had to wait on one of them. And I think it was just because they were busy. I mean, they actually just sent it back to me and <laughs> it was uh, Sinatra told me not to name drop, but it was Frank Oz. And he actually sent me a business, a, a card of his and said from the desk of Frank Oz. And he wrote, here you go, Frank. And I actually framed that card <laughs> and hung it up. Um, but he was the last one, but he didn't strike anything. I mean, he just, you know, he signed off of it and sent it back. So, so it was never really an issue with me. So um, like I said, I did it on that book and I've done two more since then. And I've never gone back to using clearances since then. John, we're talking about permissions and releases because we, we've had quite a few questions about them. So the question I asked the panelists is, have you used releases or permissions or whatever you want to call them? Do you do it at the beginning? Do you do it at the end? And what are some of the terms? Well, when you're doing a biography, you do it at the, at the beginning of uh, you know, key interview, key sources. You may have to do some backtracking. And uh, this is usually steered along by the legal department and in the vetting process. So there's not a lot of decision making uh, along the way. It, uh, it's somewhat situational. Um, I, I think, as, as I said earlier, m most interviews with sort of normal people, not celebrities or people who are protective of an uh, image, uh, it's just a, an understanding at the, at, the, uh, at the start, and it carries through. And then, of course, um, 
I use a, a transcript as a document and we, everyone signs off on that. That's what, that's what we're going to do. I did run into one episode that might be a little bit uh, enlightening in, the, in this, uh, on this topic. I had a long interview with a screenwriter who had, a, um, who gave some very, very good analysis backstage information on a, uh, a couple of directors who are well-known uh, Hitchcock being one of them. And, uh, the interview was moving along fine, but he had this, the screener had, had the control. He had permission because it was to be part of a book called craft of the screenwriter. And toward the very end, as we were almost ready to start production on the book, he called me frantically and said, he had to make some changes on in the transcript. I said, what are they? And we went through it on the phone. Of course, he took a lot of the stuff out about um, Hitchcock. And it was really good, insightful stuff. But he said, he said two things. He says, once I was going through a very bad phase with Hitch. And secondly, I was on medications. And so he had all the excuses lined up. And he was, he was kind of, you know, saying, hey, come on. He didn't want to say, you, you, you must do this. So we agreeably tightened and, and deleted and went along with a final version that he was okay with. Um, that was a few years ago. Hitch is gone. The screenwriter is gone. I sit on that information now and I, I say, hmm, this is insightful. <laughs> I'm often surprised that biographies come out and people I've done interviews with and I don't hear from the biographer. This is, a, it's not, I, I did a great interview. I did Patty Chayefsky's last interview. Never heard from the biographer. Could have took some stuff out of the files that <laughs> would have been helpful. I, I think writers sometimes overlook other writers as great sources. And there's always, always a lot of stuff on the editing room, on the editing floor. And if, if someone has, is no longer on the premises, is, is gone. I think you can look at that information, not with the tabloid editors. Well, John's point is really a good one because I think we've, at least I've experienced that. Um, writers are often not called on, but they have a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor. In the case of one book I wrote, uh, a previous biographer had donated all his files to a, a library and I found them useful. Well, yeah, I had that problem too, Jamie, real quick. Um, with When I was writing about Dr. Seuss, some of the archival material had been em embargoed, not the right word, but they weren't, they weren't giving it to me. Um, I got in touch with another Seuss biographer who was like, I took great notes on that when I was in the archives. I'm happy to send them to you and sent me scans of all his notes that he'd taken off of this material in the archives. So yeah, lean on each other, biographers, because you'll be surprised what we all have. To, and as we all know, we love to share research for the most part. So. Yeah. And so, you know, if you have an instant secondary figure coming through your biography and you've read a biography about that, I'd call up the writer. They often have wonderful insights to share. Um, we're, we've got 60 seconds left. We're coming to the end. Um, so I'm going to ask Claudia and Brian for one single useful tip. If you had only one thing to say to somebody before they went off to do an interview, what would that be? The thing that makes an interview successful, unlike other kinds of journalism, is you front loaded. So the most important part of it is what you do before you ever enter the room. And uh, that's what I tell my students, and that's what I would share with you. Come in fully prepared and be prepared to move off your preparation because you might be wrong. And you might be astonished. That's what you're looking for. So I'm seeing some of the questions are saying, how do you find out what the truth is and what are all the, you know, you have the agendas everybody has that you're trying to figure out what the truth is. Uh, I think my one bit of advice, and this encompasses everything we talked about preparation and so on, but um, I would say trust your instincts. Um, you know, you, you go in prepared, you've done your homework, you know, you know your subject, you know a lot about the people you're talking to, you've probably been talking with other people. Um, you know, you, you know your subject probably as well as anybody by a certain point. So when you go in there, um, trust your instinct and don't be afraid to roll with it. And as, as Claudia's saying, let it go off the rails and go with them sometimes, but just, just trust your instinct. If something sounds wrong to you, it, it might be, uh, you know, you've got the information. So trust your instincts. These are great suggestions. Um, there are several questions that did not get answered. 
Uh, and I want to reiterate my offer, particularly about permissions, because I've done some work on this. If you want to email me your question at mail at jamesmcgrathmorris.com, I'll be glad to either answer the question or direct your question to the right person. The room is going to remain open for 20 more minutes, and then the uh, plug will be pulled on it. So um, Michael suggests that you should use you know, the text or raise your hands under reactions and unmute yourself to um, be able to ask answer questions. Um, bio usually meets in person. And when we spill out of this room, we'd usually go for a drink and we'd get some more questions answered. We can't do that. And I can't, I can just want to emphasize that most bio members just love talking. So if there's a question you didn't get answered today, ask it of me, ask it of Brian, uh, Claudia, somebody, we'll, we're out there for you. Uh, it's been yeah. really, I took notes. I learned a lot and I hope the rest of you did. And I want to thank Claudia, Brian, and uh, John. John can't hear me thanking him, but thanks for him. <laughs> Poor John. And we did get to the end of the uh, Goldman story, which was terrific. So thank you all, and uh, we'll see you in the next room sometime. Thank you. And there's, Katie, I see you there. I told your story. I know I didn't tell it well again, but anyway, I love your story. I always tell it. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, my name is Beverly. Hello. Thank you for the great panel. I'm curious, something that I've experienced, and I interview a lot of major showbiz kinds of figures, and one of the most useful techniques I stumbled on was actually disagreeing with people who are pontificating. And when you can disagree knowledgeably, I think they step back and say, oh my goodness, this woman knows something, uh, which was not what they anticipated going in. And that, I, I use the example of Haskell Wexler, the cinematographer who's very crusty. When he lectured me about uh, a certain European film not making money because Americans just didn't have the, the sense to appreciate it. And I disagreed and told him why it did make lots of money. He said, oh, and then suddenly the interview was completely different. So I, wonder yeah, I mean, I think, I think you have to go into the room with a certain amount of confidence about yourself. And I, this is a little bit of a battle that you're, you and your source. And it, it, it's a game to some degree of control and of dominance. And um, you've got to walk in and be willing to take, take the thing by the horns and not be submissive about it. Um, so I would say that for me personally, in my real life, I'm kind of shy, I'm kind of quiet, I'm kind of soft-spoken. But when I'm in an interview, I mean, I'm good. I can set the world on fire and I know it. Um, and I'm a little more mousy in real life. Um, but some of this involves, you know, that old word about self-esteem. Go into the room and say to yourself, I have a right to be here. I have a right to ask questions. I'm the tribune of the reader. And when you sort of work on yourself that way, you get good answers, I think. Even better, Beverly, too, is if you can find somebody that they trust and love who disagrees with them, you can be like, well, that's not what Roger said. Let me tell you what Roger <laughs> said. I mean, then, then it's not, then you can like, disagree with them without being disagreeable because you're just quoting one of their friends back to them. Those are always the great, that's the low-hanging fruit you long for. Brian? Hello. Hello. Yes, I just want to say, I think Beverly's point was very well taken. It depends on who you're interviewing, but sometimes I think sharing your own point of view can bring out more of their thinking, more of their argument, more of their experience than the, the ordinary polite question. I mean, you have to play it by ear, of course, but sometimes you can get deeper that way, I think. I was gonna say, Jamie, you're muted, but I'd let you take that. 
had barking dogs in this building. Um, I think uh, James's point is a good one because it goes back to the, what Claudia and Brian were both saying about developing a relationship that bridges the gap. And, um, you know, look at two parents sitting in a park and they suddenly talk about a problem one of their children has. There's an instant bond. So sometimes in an interview, there's an opportunity where, you know, somebody says something like, that was the year my kid flunked out of school. If you nod or say, oh, I know what that's like, you get a connection. And I think James, your point's very good. The problem is that, I think probably more for Claudia, is if you interview really famous people, they're used to every kind of ploy. They're, they do an interview every five minutes. It's very hard, I find, to disarm them and, and connect. But if we're working on biography, yeah. and often the people are dead, the situation is different because they, if you have a sympathetic relation with them, they should understand that you are both trying to figure out the important truth about this person that you're prepared to write about. If you're writing about a living person for a current publication, that's different. People are protecting their reputations. But if the person's dead and you're writing about their biography, you would think enlisting them as an ally, trying to help figure out the truth of the life of this person, they would be more willing to come along with you. Yeah. Depends. I think what somebody, one of the panelists was saying is, I think James, uh, Brian was saying is, is that uh, whose truth? I mean, people have a lot of different uh, objectives, even about the dead. And we were talking about Bob Caro. I mean, Bob Caro has had to deal with people who want to really protect the reputation of Lyndon Johnson in areas when the truth uh, is, is somewhat different. Um, and his job is to get it. And that's why he's special, because he's so persistent and he doesn't stop. Um, he's terrier-like. I, I say this is the owner of a Cairn Terrier, um, and and that's he's slow. He's persistent. He gets his jaws into the the pants legs of his subjects, and he gets the material. So, um, you know, I think there are many ways to skin a mule, as the phrase goes, and you just keep at it till you get what some something like what feels like the truth now i happen to love what i do i mean i may be describing it as combat but which it sort of is uh but i really love uh this aspect of being uh, the first draft of our times and getting it and and getting the voices and being able to transmit those stories. Um, this is biography in a way. What I'm always looking for is for people to tell the stories that make their life. Um, and I, sadly, people are trained not to tell those stories, but that's, I think, what everybody wants to know, to learn from other people's lives. I mean, for God's sakes, why are people watching the Kardashians? <laughs> you know, talk about learning from life. I mean, uh, but we care. I see an interesting question. I'd like to hear the panelists respond to. They say, uh, what happens when you run into an interview subject who thinks they own the story that you're trying to get? <laughs> well, as long as they're not trying to manipulate you, which probably wouldn't be the case, uh, you let them talk. Yeah, I, I mean, I ran into, a, it's not quite the same thing, but I, I ran into a situation with a story that when I, it was somebody giving me a reported conversation. They hadn't actually been in the room when this happened, but it was a great story and I really wanted it to be true. <laughs> um, and and it turned out it was but it was one of those like it started with a reported conversation then I read another reported conversation in the archives on it so then it came it became a matter of trying to get to, to back into it who was in that room hey, can I find out who's in the room it turned out that there were four other people in the room two of whom were dead but I found the two people who were living who both verified that story 
Uh, so it, it's one of those that like, when you find somebody who like, they think they've got the goods, like I've got the gossip, here's what I hear. And they're telling you the story, like they're the only ones that have this, they're just gonna drizzle it out. I actually took that and started like trying to like unravel the sock and go see if I could find out who else might've had the goods on that one. Jamie, you're muted. Still muted. <laughs> okay, so our barking dogs. Uh, the, there's a broader question because I just saw it come across our chat room about subjects owning the rights to their stories. There's also a big ethical issue that we face as biographers. Who are we to tell somebody else's story? Particularly when we cross ethnic lines. I've written a book about a black female writer. I've now written a book that features a lot of Navajos in it. Um, and there's some really big issues involving in interviewing these folks and talking with them. And, and if they're not, you know, particularly they're not media savvy, um, people also have expectations that there's tremendous amount of money in this. Sources think, you know, they're going to get paid. Um, and that sometimes they do need to be paid. The, 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 that perfect storm book was an example of where the widows, you know, ended up with nothing for a long time. Um, so the ownership thing story, I think is really going to be big in our business. And um, I proposed a few years ago that we create a code of ethics for biographers to figure out how to deal with this. Because when we do go to somebody and say, I want to interview you about your life because I'm writing a book about you. The question of who owns that story is a major one at that point. Yeah. Who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Yeah. Um, oh, technology. Yeah, we, you know, sorry, we, we blew it. We didn't talk enough about technology. Um, again, uh, because I've answered this question in the format, I have some notes that I'd be willing to share with people if you mail me. Brian and I did a session about technology once. Um, John talked about the unreliability of using transcription services since you have to go through them anyway. I use two different transcription services that are terrific. One is very cheap. Which are they? Um, Rev is one, rev.com, and I can't remember the name of the other one. Rev has actually people who actually transcribe it. Um, they're, they're, they, they send it out piecemeal to people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very affordable and you get a very clean uh, transcript. The other one is one done by computer, which I would say its accuracy is about um, uh, 70, 60%, maybe 50%, but that's fine. When I do a two hour interview, I, there's only small parts I want and I go in and focus on them. It, the interview is fed back to you with the tape, the audio marked. So as you're reading and proofing it, you can keep pressing the button. So there's some really good technological things out there that can help us a lot. Like Brian, I always use two devices. I make them as discreet as possible. Uh, people are often put off at it first by them, but once they get going, they forget they're there. Yeah. Um, so it's worked fine for me. And, and um, I, I used to, as a reporter, take notes on a pad. I still take notes, but now I take notes that say minute 12. This is where he reveals such and such and maybe a little bit of a snippet. Yeah, I know people do it because I think Jamie, you use your iPhone still, right? You, you I use my it. iPhone and a separate device. Yeah, I, I still don't use my iPhone, but I, I use, I mean, and I'm like so analog here, but I've got this old Olympus recorder here and I have two of them. And I, like I said, I tend to, I, I will space them out, but I, I put them just down on the table where they're not obtrusive. But there are times when you're so grateful you have them because I interviewed somebody and he said, well, let's go talk out in my workshop because it's the only room in the house my wife will let me smoke. And we went out there and the reason she let it smoke is it had a gigantic fan in it. Um, and he turned that fan on the entire time and I put one down in front of him and then I put another one on a workbench, maybe 10 feet from him, just hoping to God I was gonna get something. And actually the one on the workbench got everything and the one I thought was closest to him didn't get anything. So, uh, so that's why I say, I always go in with double barrels on it to make sure that you can get it. Uh, and then I had another one where like I pulled it out and the batteries were dead. So thank God I had a backup one for that. So yeah, always have two with you anyway, regardless, I would say. But, but yeah, I don't want to be competitive. I usually take three with me. Say it again. Yeah. I'm still I usually take three yeah. because uh, it's just unreliable and you, you never get a second chance. When you try to do the interviews over, it's never as good. Yeah. On the other hand, I've done interviews and the technology failed and it wasn't such a great interview. And then I had a good excuse to go back. 
<laughs> so sometimes it can but work you for you. At NASA, because their rule is free things that were done in C. Um, but so. I use a I use a, a company called Production Transcripts that I just shoot my audio to, and they're not that expensive either. Because what they told me when I first found them was they're like, "Well, we don't transcribe; it's not going to be legally acceptable." And I was like, "Well, I don't care. It's not going to be played in a courtroom. There's a different standard for transcribing if it's going to actually be used in a court of law, as opposed to just you needing it." And you know, th there'll be a lot of times in your in your in their transcript where it'll say like unintelligible, or they'll get a name wrong, and it's kind of amusing. But because you've got the original, you can at least go back and find that part of your interview and find out what was going on there. And here. So I used them because they were really inexpensive and, and really accurate for the most part. Excellent point. Do stay clear of the transcription services that do legal work because they're very expensive. These are not. I also use the transcription service once. I have an app on my phone from Rev.com. And I was driving, and those of you who have been out to New Mexico know our distances are long, and I was driving through the Navajo Nation. And I was dictating notes to myself. To the right, Tony Hillerman had come down this road. So to the right, I was describing the red cliffs I saw. I was describing the kinds of vegetation I saw. I pressed a button and an hour later, I had all my notes printed up for me. And it was wonderful when I wrote that scene. You know, it wasn't trying to pull over and write little things. So you can use the transcription services in a number of ways. Um, so folks, we're coming up in a, about uh, 120 seconds. This room will automatically shut down this out. Even though your smiling faces have brought cheer to us, it all just go to a big click and you'll be in technological limbo. So if you've got one more question for Claudia, Brian, or me, shoot it up right now or else this will be the end. I wonder if you could talk about um, using quote, you know, quotes for the narrative. You know, in other words, um, someone says something really great, you know, at minute one, but then they say the great follow on is actually at minute four, you know, just the um, combining, you know, combining quotes in that sort of way, once you're actually writing the piece. Every each 30 seconds, my, I can probably do mine in 20 seconds, you use the quotes just like a reporter, journalistic training is, it doesn't matter when they said it or what part of the day they said it or where they said it six hours later. So if you're in an interview one day, they said, I met the love of my life, and then the next day they describe how they met it, you might use that quote at the end of your description. Quotations are to be used as long as fair to the person and in context, as you see, just like putty, uh, like clay on a, on a pot that you're making. Brian, Claudia, you got uh, another? I, I can't improve on you on that one, Jamie. No. No. Great, thank you. You are the writer. Think of the quotations as you know bits of clay and you're shaping this pot. Just be true to the person and be fair to them. Um, what I learned from writing a book about Ethel Payne, she said for her, she couldn't be objective because of being a black woman in Washington in the 50s, asking a question about civil rights would have informed, you know, changed her life, but she could be fair. And I've always thought about that. I, I want the recipient that I've written about to at least say, well, you know, I didn't like it, but at least you were fair. So that's on that note, folks, we'll see you soon. And thank you very, very much for participating in this discussion.